What is up, Humanoid Nation? Today's reaction, I'm going to be... Wow, I fucked that up already. What is up, Humanoid Nation? Today, I'm going to be reacting to Parts Fun Known, 10 wrestlers who didn't fit great factions. I would also say, like, the worst factions, because some of the worst factions were, like, funny. Like the job squad. Oh, wait, everybody fit, fit in that. What the hell am I talking about? Okay, that's stupid. Never mind. Anyway, let's get to this. Let's do this. Everybody has that friend in the group that just doesn't quite fit in. Maybe they entered the friend group late. Maybe they have a completely different style. Maybe they just tag along with their partner and no one is honest enough to tell Janet that her new boyfriend mm -hmm. makes everyone uncomfortable. Can't stand that guy. Not all groups can be thick as thieves, and a lot of the time in wrestling, it's easy to look at the police lineup of a great faction and pluck one dude or dudette out who just feels out of place. One of these wrestlers is not like the other. One of these wrestlers just doesn't belong. There's too many syllables. Yeah, we're picking on folks who didn't fit in today, kind of like a Canadian dude wearing a mask amongst a group of Brits that he's still never met. I'm Tempest Hailing from Parts Fun Known, and these are 10 wrestlers who didn't fit great factions. You could be on this list and too. Now you show don't your quite own fit the faction YouTube of people channel. that aren't subscribed to Parts Fun Known, but there's a very easy subscribe. fix. Just hit that subscribe button and enable notifications so you never miss a fun video just like this one. Honorary mention, Kurt Angle, The Shield. Here comes Seth, here comes Dean, and here comes Kurt in tactical gear with the biggest, goofiest- Is it really perfect? Is it really for- Does he fit? Because it was only for one night, so... Yeah, honorary mention, because- uh, he just came back. Yeah, just look smile at his goofy his smile. Face. An honorary shield member of sorts, but he just looks so damn happy about it. I treasure Kurt Angle. Number 10, Hornswoggle, DX. Oh. In 2006. Oh, damn, I forgot about that. Was he not a mascot? Uh, yeah, he was a mascot, wasn't he? Shawn Michaels was a dude in his 40s, pretending to be a dude in his 30s, pretending to be 14. By the time 2009 and the 39th of 86 DX reunions took place, Shawn Michaels and Triple H instead tried pretending to be six. They'd say their rivals were, quote, like butts, sick burn guys, I really hope this PG thing catches on, but the full transformation of PGX came with the introduction of Hornswoggle as team mascot. Yeah, Granted, he was a mascot. This was very much a kid's yeah, show yeah. at the time, but now DX was crawling under the ring into Hornswoggle's little person dimension so they could attend and little people's court and let's just say it wasn't my cup of tea hey that's a british thing right guys number nine evil bullet club it's not every day i, I get don't to know nothing about new japan, japan. Entry into one of these it's i like to watch new like. japan bullet club is the desktop wallpaper of half the I'm iwc from 2014 to 2018 it. with the group being one of the largest and fastest changing on this list the uber popular heel faction sold merch out the ass but by the time 2020 rolled around all the merch sellers were gone and new japan tasked career goth mid carter evil with leading the group but with evil it goes deeper than simply not fitting his introduction coincides directly with a massive plummet and in interest in the group that had been trending downwards since the Cody departure. always wearing them suits. He always looks like he didn't belong in anything these guys were in. Because these guys all wearing shirts and regular clothes and Cody always on the side just wearing suits. But hey, it's Cody. Cody being Cody. Bullet Club had been moving away from the outsider status that they'd built their name on, but since Evil has taken over, it has been unrecognizable. It's fine to take the group in a new direction, you just might want to make sure that direction isn't going to be part of the reason for the massive drop in interest in your promotion first. He's the only leader not to live up to his predecessors, and that's just a bummer. Number 8, Bam Neely, Ooh. La Familia. Ooh. All together now. <laughs> Who? Oh, Is come on. They already did a joke for me, but yeah, okay. Oh, Chavo's guy from ECW. Bam this Neely dude. being a developmental call-up from 2008, of course I know everything about who he is and what he's about, because 2008 was a great year and somehow I recorded all of it to memory, but only the wrestling, not the politics or recession. Bam Neely debuted on ECW the week after WrestleMania 24 as Chavo Guerrero's bodyguard, slotting himself into top heel faction La Familia. You wouldn't expect Chavo Guerrero's ECW bodyguard to play a major factor in a group like this. 
Oh, there's no but. He didn't play any factor in it. Yeah, I don't remember nothing from him. I have to think his name was derived from hockey player Cam Neely, but pardon my Canadiana, it's very difficult to find things to say about Bam Neely. La Familia was an awesome heel faction thanks to the chemistry between Edge and Vicky Guerrero, and future Impact rivals the Edgeheads doing the grunt work. Speaking of Impact, Chavo was never pushed again after visiting the Impact Zone before Mania, so it seems more odd that that was the time they chose to give him a heater. His nickname could have been Bam Bam. Bam 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 Neely. Printing money. Yeah, that would work. Number seven, bam, bam. Jimmy Garvin, the fabulous Freebirds. Hold on, now, I like Jimmy Garvin. Why? Why? Maybe I haven't seen all of his stuff from the Freebirds, but I like Jimmy Garvin in the Freebirds. Why do people always shit on him in the Freebirds? For any Jimmy Garvin fans come out of the woodwork to lunge for my throat, this is not regarding any of the Freebirds' golden years. Oh, they were okay. one of the best factions of all time and drew a ton of money, but by the time 1989 rolled around and the Freebirds found themselves in Crockett country, they weren't drawing money anymore. Granted, there's a few reasons for that. Terry Gordy was primarily working in Japan, and Buddy Roberts stayed in World Class Championship Wrestling before retiring from the ring. What was left was the duo of Michael Hayes, the freest of all birds, but not a strong worker in the ring, and Jimmy Garvin, who had to be the star of the show to make up for it. Nothing against Jimmy Garvin, he was a talented performer, but when you think of the fabulous Freebirds, you think of the riots against the Von Erics with Terry Gordy and Buddy Roberts and Michael Hayes cutting promos. Garvin got much larger and tried to work a much more dominant style, but as a five 10 guy in 1989 it was a hard sell if you're driving home and you ask your mom to stop for fabulous freebirds and she says you have fabulous freebirds at home this was the fabulous freebirds <laughs> at home. number six okay sunny the legion of doom it really hey, is easier to remember the road she, warriors she was a, peak. probably she was a valet valet wasn't she or manager who the hell cares the coolest tag team of all time, WWE could never, never figure worked. out exactly how to get Aikman and Razor over. Sonny was the never worked. Wrote. Wow, that's not right either. There's a lot of these. I strongly considered putting Rocco, the stupid ventriloquist puppet, on this list, but as much as Sonny isn't a wrestler, the puppet isn't even human, even if it does have Paul Ellering's hand up its ass. Likewise, with Draws, Crush, and Heidenreich, none of these guys really fit the group either, but at the very least, they were big dudes who could throw you around. That's basically all the Road Warriors did. They were just cooler about it. Sonny became Hawk and Animal's manager as part of LOD 2000 at WrestleMania 14, and while she was a more than capable manager, the Road Warriors weren't the type of team to fit with a hot blonde. I also don't have any jokes to say about Sonny. I can't find amusement in it right now. Don't drive drunk, people. No and don't go to jail every, every other week. And going to jail every other week. Number five, Manu. Le oh god, I forgot about Manu. Legacy. He was Great forgettable. might be a stretch when talking about Legacy, but they were a solid enough heel faction for a couple years there. This was probably the best period of Randy Orton's career, and he had a pair of young guns to keep his title safe. Wasn't Sim Snuka Besson, part Ted of this? And Cody Rhodes had Wasn't Sim Snuka, Sim Snuka part of the group, or was he trying to get into the group? Oh god, it was 2008, 2009, ugh. At Orton's back, but many forget the faction's origins involved a pair of other stars looking to solidify their legacies. One of which was son of wild Samoan Afa and cousin of Roman Reigns, Manu, who debuted at Unforgiven 2008 and joined forces with Rhodes and DiBiase, just known as Priceless at the time. At first, it seemed as if that was your trio, but Rhodes and DiBiase were vying for Orton's attention, and WWE's plans didn't involve their newest member of The Rock's family. He was just According there. to Cody Rhodes, Manu was wasn't told about this and was about as excited as you would be if you reached level 987413 in Mouse Quest. This very much seemed like WWE pulled the plug on Manu and fellow list candidate Sim Snuka because as Legacy uh, was christened with their go. beatdown, Manu was never seen again and Sim Snuka would go on to be part of one of the most famous WrestleMania botches of all time. I'm sure they were told to let it play out. Number 4, Paul Roma, the Four Horsemen. The job guy from WWE? Those are not my words, those are the words of one Triple H, utterly I like Paul Roma. Power and Glory. I don't know. I like the Young Stallions. Okay, I can see why he didn't fit the Four Horsemen. Young Stallions, Power and Glory. Yeah, yeah. Still, I like Paul Roma. I have no problem with him, but he doesn't fit the Four Horsemen. Befuddled by the inclusion of no name Paul Roma being welcomed into the esteemed Four Horsemen in 1993. Roma had been part of Power and Glory in WWE alongside Hercules Hernandez. 
I mean, Hernandez definitely brought the power. I'm not sure Roma supplied much glory. They didn't win it many matches did. together, often losing to the Rockers, so Roma's immediate inclusion in what was considered by many to be the greatest wrestling faction of all time went over about as well as an acid rain shower after your last shift at the bowling alley. Considering this is WCW in the year 1993 we're talking about, we're lucky it was only this bad and they didn't try and put the Shockmaster in the group while they were at it. I mean, it sounds crazy, but so does trying to say Paul Roma was a four horseman caliber star with less build up than WrestleMania 38. Number three, Samoa Joe, the main event mafia. Is I may like, love the main event mafia, had, uh, ironically, but I kill still people love with them. Machete? The people writing TNA Wrestling in 2008 had gotten tired of hearing Dixie Carter talk about all the people she used to watch on TV, so they just decided to put them all together in one group. That's NWO not true, but it makes sense to me. Kurt Angle led the way while Sting held the heavyweight title. Wait, and hold kept... on. NWO, original NWO, NWO, black and white, silver... NWO Wolfpack, so this would be NWO 4.0? Kevin Nash, Booker T, and Scott Steiner all did their part. The story was pretty simple. The veterans were tired of being disrespected by the TNA originals and banded together to rule the main event scene. A good start to an angle, but as was the case for most of the TNA era, a good start didn't guarantee a satisfactory ending. I usually find these didn't kind of factions Crimson lose in a there lot of steam when you start fiddling with the people in it, and that's exactly what happened when TNA original Samoa Joe joined the group at Slammiversary 2009. Nation of Violence face tattoo machete wielding Samoa Joe at that. The worst version of Samoa Joe. This is where the faction fell apart, merged with Eric Young's World Elite, and fizzled out, and it really was because Joe didn't fit, and his inclusion forced the group to become just another bunch of heels, no longer joined by a common goal. Go back and listen to that theme, though. A banger. It is a banger. Do, 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 do. Eel, eel, eel. Number two, Randy Orton, the Wyatt family. Yeah, he never Before we it. had the spooky bollocks yeah, of Alexa Bliss. Before we had the red light of Randy Orton. Even Daniel Bryan. Wait, Daniel Bryan worked because he had a beard. Randy Orton just was Randy Orton. The Fiend. We had Randy Orton being hypnotized, question mark. During the reintroduction of the brand split, Randy Orton squared off against Bray Wyatt. Oh boy, a new young star to work with. I'm sure we'll have so many great wrestling matches together, a particularly jovial Randy Orton surely said to himself as the taste of black sludge suddenly appeared in his mouth. Orton's rivalry and team with Bray Wyatt was extremely goofy stuff, with Randy Orton's eyes glowing backstage as Wyatt had him under his control. But he didn't have him under his control because Orton was tricking him. But then what were the eyes, Randy? What were the eyes? Orton's time as an undercover agent tearing the Wyatt family apart from the inside was fruitful, but while it was happening, it was very hard to look at Randy Orton beside Luke Harper, RIP love you Brody, and Bray R. Wyatt when the only thing he did to look spooky was put a hoodie on. He didn't even put the hood up half the time. And number one, Mark Jindrak, uh, Evolution. Ha <laughs> ha, uh, not really. I mean kind of, but no, not I feel sorry for Mark Jindrak. I like Mark Jindrak. Ah, uh, but Triple H is such an asshole. He's such an asshole. Not really. And number one, Sting, the NWO. NWO. I don't care if it was the NWO Red and Black. I don't care if they were the babyface side of the group. The man called Sting should never be in the NWO. Like there have DDP. been a lot of entries to this point where the guy just wasn't the right fit, but this one is purely based on the principle of the matter. Because honestly, if half of Bullet Club could be on this list, then f seven eighths of the NWO sure could be. There was no one who better represented the spirit of WCW than Sting, and he'd been built up as the chief adversary of the NWO for over a year before his match with Hulk Hogan at Starcade 97. You know, the dumb one. To just throw that away for the sake of adding another shock member to the NWO gives me serious McMahon shaking hands with Austin vibes. The only difference being Austin was the biggest star of the biggest company at its peak, and here the NWO had already passed its peak, so it didn't have the same significance it would have a year earlier. The same way that seeing Brett Favre in a Vikings jersey makes me sick to my stomach is how it feels to look at Sting in an NWO shirt. And if my very personal and not at all relatable football analogy doesn't pull at your heartstrings, realize the NWO caused sunburnt sting red and black sting is the worst sting and that's our list uh, but it did give us the best theme song of nwo wolf pack come on you gotta admit the nwo wolf pack's theme song was a banger their sting shouldn't have been in there now imagine if ddp was in there him fighting all this time almost going in but kicking their ass at the end that was a good way but then uh yeah sting should have been in there but yeah, that's all I have to say. That's it for now, Humanoid Nation. Humanoid freak out. Bye. Pasito a pasito, suave suavecito. 